I have a question. <coughs> Maybe um, you could, at, at the end of your talk, you alluded to uh, the machinations, the, the Nazi machinations behind uh, Kristallnacht, uh, which, as you, you said properly with a fair warning, at the beginning of your talk, uh, you weren't going to discuss, and now that you've given us all this uh, fascinating, ethnographically uh, rich uh, material about uh, Greenspan's uh, very strange fate and, and life and afterlife, I, I can see why uh, you wanted to remain with, with his story uh, and its uh, Uh, after effects, but I think uh, maybe, maybe you could talk for a, a couple of minutes at least, or a minute, about uh, the, the <coughs> misplaced guilt. Now I'm answering my own question, which is always a bad uh, practice for a moderator. But, but uh, the circumstances surrounding Kristallnacht, and now, in, in fact, if I, if I understand correctly, uh, these machinations had been set in motion for reasons that were internal to Nazi party politics uh, um, that bore, in fact, uh, little or no relation to his deed. Um, so maybe you could connect, connect up your, your story with uh, the uh, developments uh, in, in German anti-Semitism and, and Nazi uh, union politics at the time. Without, without giving another lecture. <laughs> okay, if you're asking the one thing is the question of uh, how <coughs> so-called Rice Kristallnacht. I mean, Rice Kristallnacht somehow is a, mm, a problematic type. First of all. Um, as I also mentioned here, on the 7th of November, there were pogroms in Kostel and in Kurhessen, uh, which is not the Kreis Kristallam, because that's on the 9th of November. Uh, second, the Kreis Kristallam, the so called Kreis Kristallam, uh, the event on the 9th and the 10th, uh, it's not so clear how it really, I mean, how all the pogroms started. Um, that there were so many people interacting. We know, of course, that there were uh, <coughs> tensions inside the uh, um, German so-called elite at the time uh, who were in favor of what they saw as an uh, outbreak of just folk star, and there were fractions who were strongly against it. The, um, the, the second one is, for example, I mean, normally it's, you know, Picked out by, by Goering, who said, Why, 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 why did you, you will not just uh, slaughter 200 Jews uh, and left all the um, uh, German uh, goods intact? Because a lot of harm was done to, in 38, the process of so called Aryanization was at full speed. So all the Jewish property that was destroyed in the so called Kristallnacht was in the process of immediately going over into Aryan hands. So actually, what was destroyed was property that was more or less immediately after that belonged anyway to the German uh, folk or, or, or to the state or whoever grabbed it. <coughs> so there was a big thing there. There was a, a huge conference that took place immediately after that on the 11th of November in the Luftfahrt Ministerium, the Ministry of uh, uh, Aviation, where, where Berlin invited practically the whole elite of Germany at the time to discuss exactly those questions about, you know, who will pay? Should now the German, for example, Allianz, should they pay um, for the broken glass to the Jews who own the properties or not? And the, the insurance 
policy was if we don't pay, our international reputation is the collapse. So we have to pay the Jews. Um, they wanted to be a way to pay. So Goering said, no, don't pay the Jews. We have to find other things. And when we look at this, we have an excerpt of this um, a long discussion. The people there were Heinrich was in the meeting. Purple Squad there. Uh, um, Goering, of course, was there. Um, so about 120 very high-ranking people. And they made a lot of sarcastic, the sarcasm in this, in this uh, meeting is eminent. And the people who were there were people who later on one of them became the head of the Deutsche Bundesbank. This were real kind of uh, bureaucrats also. And they started making jokes about uh, should we give the Jews certain places in the woods where they should be allowed to go? Then they start saying, yeah, maybe when there are animals who look like Jews, it seems that we really believe sarcastic remarks. And my reading of this uh, horrible document is that I think that both those who actually were in favor of the pogroms and those who were against it, something changed with the pogroms. So anti-Semitism, when it's set in action, also changes the, the way people think about it. Even those who actually thought it was a mistake, Certainly, there was a gap. There was something, you know, uh, uh, there was a step taken, uh, and from then on, suddenly everything seemed open. They suddenly felt, mm, what's next? What can we do now? So they sat together in a group of 120 people, and so, mm, how can we now go on? It was not important if they were in favor of uh, going that route or not. Um, we also know, um, and this is uh, something that uh, was found Steinberg's so a very fine book that came out of the University Press uh, two years ago with Christana. Uh, we had a seminar together uh, for uh, half a year in uh, Frankfurt. And he pointed that already out that um, about 33,000 33, men, mainly men, were put into concentration camps immediately after the programs. That had nothing to do actually with and we're not the same people in there. And if you look how the percentage, it means in more or less every fourth or fifth German family, there was someone who was either in Samstenhausen or Buchenwald uh, or Brandy, uh, so it was in or Dacha, well, that's one in the camp. So the event, in a way, was small, but at the same time, the, the power of ex escalation was immense. But those for the uh, side of the for the Jewish side, uh, who after after this, uh, everyone was very disappointed, <coughs> and there was no kind of uh, rollback. It, it went from day to day worse. That was not the case between 33 and 38. There were there were there were moments where more Jews went back into Germany between 33 and 38 than uh, emigrated. And that was exactly what the, the, the Nazis were uh, very uh, nervous about. And they were mainly responsible for the pogroms, but also those who were against the pogroms, they somehow something, something changed in, in the way the Nazis worked, I would say. Thank you. Well, I wonder if I can ask you a story. Can I go to the, the mic, perhaps? So, yeah. I wonder if I could ask you a slightly speculative question, which is Herschel Greenspun shot and rot 10 days earlier or 10 days later. Would his act have been used as a pretext for, for the Christophe Bell overall? I mean, it seems to me that it's just this strange, unfortunate, uncanny coincidence that he chose that particular day, which had such symbolic significance, particularly for the Nazi party, but the, the party then, the Nazis then used it as a, as a pretext to launch, uh, to launch a Of course, I would like to know your answer. This too. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think it's implied by the question. 
much do you think? What, what do you think? Do you think it, it would have? Do you think it, it would not have the same effect? I mean, we have, of course, the cases that you mentioned, like Frankfurt, uh, uh, Davos. Actually, nothing happened. Exactly. Nothing. That, that's why I'm asking the question, because of these previous incidents. I mean, it just seems, I mean, I think 38, um, everything comes together in 38. And it starts, actually, it starts more or less in January 38, yeah. the, the escalation. So I do think. Well, I mean, Kristallnacht is also often. I mean, some historians have argued that it's a. That Kristallnacht is actually a turning point in terms of the control, uh, the control of not of, of Jewish policy within the Nazi Party. That this is sort of the last gasp of the brown shirts, you know, of taking street action, and that from this point onward, because Kristallnacht was actually such an international failure. There was such a widespread disapproval of the wanton destruction of property that from that point onwards, the SS actually takes control of Jewish policy. And, and that really is, is a, a, a truly substantive shift uh, in, in, in the way in which the Jews are then treated. I, I wouldn't disagree with that analysis. However, I would say even the SS who then took control over was no longer the same SS that it was prior to the meeting. That's what I want to say is this meeting. Right. If you listen to the, the map, you know, that all something has changed. They saw this is possible. We can do this. You're right. I mean, there were, of, of course, also um, problems. Um, Maybe the harshest reaction uh, came in this country. Uh, the US uh, really broke ties with Nazi Germany after we started. Uh, not, not all countries. Um, one could also say that in 38, we also have, of course, Elyon, we have Munich, we have um, the, the, the pressure that the Jews should go out of Germany gets stronger and harder every single day. And in other countries, including uh, my own land in Switzerland, try harder and harder not to accept any Jews. So, so there was kind of, um, so the Kristalla played a role in this game. That's why I focus so much on the, on the Polish uh, German interaction that was, you know, this has not seen way, this has not seen the Holocaust. It was, much earlier in the way. But at the same time, if you then look at how individuals acted during the Christian war, something that had never been done properly before, and what the role they played afterwards, for example, in the uh, Einhard uh, or uh, in Lodge, or in different SS groups, you see that there is also a community of personality. A lot of the people who were specifically involved in the Christian war were later on also involved in the Holocaust. So, I mean, that doesn't completely um, uh, negate the argument that the kind of antisemitism, uh, the Vernunft, the kind of antisemitism of reason that SS wanted to follow against the antisemitism of the uh, proletarian antisemitism of the Pope. Uh, that this did not somehow change uh, in terms of the hierarchy who was in charge. But I would always say that the pogroms also influenced those who, as we possibly all in this room would say, they, there is no antisemitism of reason <laughs> that the SS claimed for themselves. It's, of course, it was based on it. But uh, they, they uh, uh, used it. So we don't know, of course, what we have had in the decades before or later, as, all, as always in history. But my feeling is it all came together. It was the right moment. And everyone was aware. I mean, I tried to find out, for example, in Kassel, who was responsible for the pogroms in Kassel. It was not Goebbels. Goebbels not even knew about it. It was no one in Berlin, obviously. So it started in Kassel. 
7 of November. It was not, uh, there is no historian who would claim it was organized. But, uh, so that shows that th this situation was already so um, uh, tense uh, that somehow it crystallized.
And I think if you look in her work, in her essays, from you know, her, her early Jewish action essays, that there's a very strong residual Zionism. She had been Zionist at one point, it was disillusioned. But she still retained the notion that Jewish politics and the diaspora were really, either politics or Jewish politics were impossible or that they were ultimately always in that, of course, then translated into her view of the leaders of the Jewish Council during, during, during the war itself. So I think for that reason, she would have been reluctant to see his act, his act as one of civil disobedience. But you can't call murder civil disobedience. Mm -hmm. That's well, just not, it's not in the same category. I didn't mean that. I didn't mean yeah. that. Yeah. No, that, but, but, see as some kind of political act rather than just as the act of a, of a psychopath or some kind of sociopathic. Yeah, I know. Yeah. yeah. I mean, in, in a way, it's, I, I, yeah, thanks, thanks, David. I, I think, uh, I have to think, but in a way, uh, that she was so much, uh, she was so critical against the jubilator, yeah. and at the same time, she was so critical about someone who was really on the totally different uh, uh, spectrum of, of um, taking action directly. Uh, it's, it's an interesting fact. Um, but again, my feeling is it's, it, it has to do with her Eichmann, which I think is very weak, because they with her Eichmann book. It has to do with her Eichmann book. Yeah. She makes a lot of very strange things that she holds that not fit in her, uh, in, in all of other statements. It's just, it's just, I don't see her as so uh, coherent. I mean, also when we look at who did she uh, quote in terms of, of politics, I mean, she read all of Carl Schmidt. She also quotes him, she also defends him, yeah. uh, but probably she doesn't know the facts, and she just writes here and also gives the answers. Of course, the only end of what to do. She uses his uh, idea of, of what, what political action means. Um, uh, and there, of course, if you use Schmidt, there is no Jewish politics. It can't exist. There is no state. There is no uh, possibility to declare war. Uh, so, in a way, uh, at the same time, I think you're right. I mean, there is the Zionist uh, aura to at least this phase of her and, um, and uh, the role she played there uh, is, is one that we only now slowly discover, which was in Frankfurt, for example, in my museum, because then it was the collecting point for Judaic objects. It's all about all and aren't her in the Jewish Reconstruction Organization of the world, they went to Frankfurt and Hofbau, um, and then decided where should the Jewish ceremonial objects go to, uh, because they were vehemently opposed to the Jewish state <coughs> in Europe. So they sent to Buenos Aires, to Jerusalem, to New York, and she was part of that. It's also a phase that a lot of modern uh, art scholars don't know so much about and how much she was involved actively, also in what I would call Jewish. Uh, Frank Meisner. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to briefly go back to this sort of situation at the end of October 38, at, at which I think you would sort of underplay a little bit, because I think the drama in Germany was very dramatic in the sense that um, what happened to the uh, stateless Jews um, was something that was little, I think, fairly little recognized by the rest of the population, also by the German Jews, we, we had a lot of drug problems, but until that point, um, non-German non Jews um, were in many ways sort of not falling under the same kind of restrictions and legislation as a result. And so that um, I, I know the situation from Leipzig where um, Polish Jews then would flee into the, uh, the, the, the house of, of, the, of the American consul and, and hang out for weeks 
the same as uh, they they did in this in this border strip between Germany and Poland, and, and it, it's sort of from the document. It, it's it's a very under researched um, uh, event or period, and and the, the drama that the three different folds here is something that. Uh, somebody like Greenspan Green would, would, would have known, and, and somebody like Arendt would also have known, since she in Paris at the time worked in, in refugee aid and, and was involved in very sort of practical politics. And so the, the, the sort of rift that, that emerged between the Polish Jews and the German Jews also, um, I mean, that, that Greenspan's uh, action sort of drives another wedge into this whole situation. I mean, you're right that 38 at the end of it is, is sort of a, a situation sort of tightens enormously and, and uh, this, this sort of before and after and then sort of after November 38, it is clear to everybody in Germany also um, that, that everything sort of change and I mean that, that, that these sort of two weeks were actually 10 days between uh, October 28th and, and <coughs> I mean that this is sort of a very crucial period and, and I, I'm wondering uh, when you write the book are you going into more detail about this and how does it sort of also report it in the present? Um, thanks uh, Frank. Um, I mean, there is one point where, where I, I mean, a lot of what you say, I, I totally agree. Um, um, I will not be able to cover it because it's, it's, you know, I was asked by the publisher to write 128 pages and uh, not one more, not one less. So it, uh, it's a very restricted format uh, that the bank wants. Uh, and I this uh, um, I think. When you say when you said only October or November for the German Jews it starts, that I disagree because in July '38 there was the Juli Aktion, especially in Berlin, and every Jew there were, there were uh, about four thousand, three to four thousand Jews were put in concentration camps for, for example, uh, crossing uh, the street without waiting for the signal. Uh, that was. They, they were waiting exactly. They, they wanted to, to stay an example, and about three, four thousand were put in concentration. So there was already quite a lot of pressure, also not just in Polish Jews, but still, you are right. The, the kind of um, how they saw each other and how this interaction were. Um, I have been in touch, and I think it's, it's a very interesting thing. And it comes through, of course, because that's why I always put the finger in this that he, he has a Polish, Polish passport. He, I mean, Greenspan, he didn't spoke Polish. He never learned Polish. So he would have, uh, you know, had to go back to a country that he had no ties to. Um, uh, so in that respect, um, it's also tricky to know in what way he Self identified uh, with that group, or if it was like it came to him that suddenly he became again a Polish Jew, and then he felt all oh, the non Polish German Jews do not react in the way I would uh, hope to. Uh, that, you know, the story is very interesting. But, uh, I, I unfortunately I couldn't do it. I also have mentioned, but I, I do mention this, of course, in the book. Uh, that after the so-called Anschluss of Austria, there were also a lot of pogrom-like situations in Vienna. Uh, and exactly people who were there in charge came then uh, in charge for the Aktion uh, Einhard. And they were very cruel already uh, early in 1938. The Austrian Jews uh, suffered a lot of the Anschluss. Uh, the most severe uh, ones, of course, is the Poland. Jews from the world no longer, all of them immediately uh, expelled. Uh, that was in the end the reason why their chance to survive the Holocaust was the highest. 
pickers that have been spot the earliest, so that they had a chance if they were lucky. Should just we can just stand there. Okay. It's just a small question that I was struck by the description you gave of uh, this meeting with the heads, bureaucratic figures, making these satirical jokes about brutality that they were committing against the Jews, and I was. Maybe humor was a way for them to, you know, obviously not the most diabolical of them, but you know, people who were maybe slightly uncomfortable, you know, were deeply uncomfortable, but how they had to conform uh, to what was going on. And so maybe humor was a way for them to somehow acknowledge the wrong and to live with the law at the same time, accept it uh, in some way. So I think humor was actually. Something that circulated widely among the general public in the newspapers. <coughs> there was jokes about the Pluto as a political battle or about the concentration camps about Gavis. And I've never thought about this before, but it's just because maybe humor was part of the way that people kind of cope because they knew that there was something that would be too long. I just want to get into that. Well, interesting, interesting question. Um, Yes, but when, when I look at those kind of funny, you know, encounters between people like that we wouldn't consider as being very funny, Heidrich and Irving, um, making jokes, uh, that I'm sure they found, you can see that they were laughing, it was clear that they, they had fun somehow. Um, and I was trying to find out, you know, what, what was the situation. Um, I think your reading of it not necessarily contradicts to what I think that um, something has happened that has never happened before on that scale. I mean, we should not forget that there were, uh, um, I, I'm not, uh, I wasn't mentioning this here, but the amount of people who were murdered in Cristobal has been, it's, it's, it's shocking, it's shocking amount all this on the streets. So there were so many people involved uh, with this in every smallest village and part of Germany. Uh, schools and children were <coughs> asked to participate in, in, you know, go there and participate there and so on. It, it had such a big impact that I don't think, yes, it somehow must, uh, we, we must think how, how did the people react to it. And the kind of the standard reading was always um, like they were talking maybe this very clearly. There is the Reichsheitshauptamt, there is the SS, there is the people of Heydrich and the Gestapo. They actually didn't like it because it was uh, irrational in their view. And they wanted to rather fill the concentration camps. They've already made up lists of over 30,000 Jewish men that they <coughs> wanted to put in concentration camps and then they implemented it. Uh, at that moment, uh, because they want to pressure them to Aryanize their, uh, their um, shops and their, their properties. Um, so they did not like that a lot of this property was destroyed. But then they were meeting with the people who organized the program in the same room, and they had a lot to love. And my reading of this, those antagonists who were sometimes, you know, fighting strong uh, against each other, uh, that those were small parts, um, is that somehow for all of them there was something like um, uh, redemption, you know, that's what also maybe uh, um, the news. There was a kind of redemptive power of something happened. And they joined the, you know, even so they had opposing views and they continued to have opposing views. Because I haven't seen it from other uh, yeah. Yeah. The other thing you asked somehow, I think, is, is you know, it could be a, another study to be a little bit uh, added to the previous study. Yes. I'm 
may have missed this, uh, but um, your, your focus on the dramatic impact of Kristalla on the Nazi leadership. Um, there's some idiosyncratic evidence that a lot of the German Jews uh, weren't focused enough on what really was going to happen to them. All the changes were incremental. You know, don't sit on park benches, you can't teach. Schools, so on and so forth. The Stalinist uh, wedged into their brains that, that the change is really critical. And when they came back from concentration camps, Sachsenhausen, Buchenwald, immigration really began. So I'm wondering if you, it's not your research project, but I'm wondering if you have data on the uh, explosion of immigration.
think we're, we're past the bewitching hour of 6 o'clock right now. But, um, I hope uh, you'll join me in thanking uh, Rafael Gross for a very stimulating day. I'd like to thank the audience personally for posting.